So kia ora, hello and welcome to today's Weber Training Teleclass Lecture. My name is Jane Barnett. I'm delighted to be with you today uh, for the first of 2022's Weber Training South Pacific uh, Weber, uh, Lecture Series. So thank you for joining us today. Um, the, my pleasure to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Salu Muhyiddin. Is a, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Management at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He's been involved in both research and teaching roles, especially on the study of population health and population mobility issues and its consequences in different settings, such as Asia, West Africa and Australia. Related with maternal health, Dr. Mohideen's most recent work focus on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic to the maternal health and health workers, and also on the community engagement in reducing maternal and child mortality in Indonesia and the evaluation of Revolusi KIA health programme on health facility birth in the same country. So thank you so much for agreeing to be part of our Web Training Telecast series, um, Salu, and uh, I'll hand over to you now and we'll listen to your lecture with lots of interest. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Jane, for uh, introducing myself. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone from Sydney. Uh, I'm based at Macquarie University in Sydney, so currently still in the afternoon. So uh, welcome to the first one I had from Jane at the 2022 Pele class seminar. So what I'm going to present today as in the handout that has been distributed above. Uh, it's actually it's not only my work, but it's kind of like collaboration work with my other colleague and also my student talking about the mental health of healthcare workers in the COVID-19 pandemic situation. So in the second page, like in, in your handout, uh, what I'm going to talk today is basically uh, just give you a little bit about the background why we are interested in uh, discussing about this one and the way that we did it this study is not directly to uh, ask all the health workers but rather than doing the systematic review so in that way we uh, I think it's very important that we also give you a little bit uh, brief discussion on how uh, we are doing it and also maybe it is uh, could help anyone who also want to do other review. Then we, later on, we focus directly on the healthcare workers and the pandemic situation. What that about, and then what the situation around the world one, and what the kind of like the mental health issues among the healthcare workers because of this situation. So this uh, teleclass, I'm going to conclude by having recommendations, but also conclusions. So if anyone who are interested in more detail about the study, you could find our study uh, being published in the Journal of Diabetes and Metabolic Disorder uh, back in uh, October 2020. That's during the situation in the first year when the pandemic hit our uh, global world market. So in the next slide, uh, in the page three, so this is kind of like the background that we're thinking, uh, myself and my other colleague, talking about, yes, we've been hit kind of like today, we are almost like uh, past the second year or this update, right? Uh, it was started in December 2019, but only until February, WHO kind of like declared and named this pandemic so-called as COVID-19. So it means there are some time delaying in terms of the first finding of this COVID and also kind of like declaring this has become the object. Even so, just in March, kind of like the case outside of China, which is in Thailand, uh, they found some cases like this one. So in, in short that this is kind of like a new virus. So because of this is new thing, so a lot of unknown, uh, including with what there is. The risk that we know today, or the symptoms that we know today, the variant that we know in the beginning, may change later on. Just in terms of variant, for example, at the beginning we just know about one variant, but later on, when someone finds in India, they call it Delta variant, and then eventually, even uh, the end of the year 
last year, we heard another so-called Omicron. So it means there are still a lot of uncertainty and unknown. So that's why we need to kind of like to study about this one uh, and some consequences. So the consequences to help get workers already kind of like very evident in the first place. Just like uh, in the beginning when the study in Wuhan, about 29% all patients who've been kind of like treated because of this SARS-CoV-19, uh, COVID among of those patients, 29% are the uh, healthcare worker. So it means because of they are dealing with directly, even they're maybe healthy in the first place, but because of the interaction and also uh, due to of the work environment, they could can be affected. Okay, so that's the first background. The second background that uh, I put into the handout slide number four. So. Who's going to be affected is basically anyone. Either you are young or you are already adult or even older. Whether you are male or female, you still get it because most are traces to person anyone who have been contact with the infected person. Usually because of respiratory and also because of the droplet. And then the most high risk mostly occur in the crowded area or place. Uh, including like uh, in the health facility, in particular when the peak uh, cases, when even in some places or around the world, like I heard in India or in Indonesia or in any places, not only hospital become the place a war zone, but also they use other places. So it's become like very crowded and then the uh, patient coming in is very, very uh, big number. So one big impact of COVID-19 causing is basically mental problem. It's not only the health problems, but also mental problems. Not only the patient itself, but also people who's dealing with this one, the family, the healthcare workers, and a lot of people, okay? Especially for the healthcare workers, this has become even very crucial because they are the one kind of like the front line, the first person who needs to be taken. Uh, until like the beginning, not even like the middle or the last one. So they are the first person to become like the uh, highly demand. So they also can like not only risk in terms of dealing with directly the patient, but also the also risk of occupation. Uh, that's why uh, a lot of people saying that uh, yes, this is the health issues, but also uh, economic issues in terms of public health issues, in terms of a lot of issues one. But in particular for the healthcare worker, this is really issues not only physical but also mental for them as well. So that's why uh, we try to do this study with the objective is to review all research that have been conducted on the mental health status of healthcare workers. Uh, and then once we presented this one, we would like to bring attention to the policymaker, but also the majors about, hey, have a look. They have done a lot, and then we do need something to take care about their health as well. So uh, just before uh, I'm going to try to the next slide one, uh, I give you some ideas in slide five and slide six on indicate about how the possible sources of the infection uh, at the workplace among the healthcare workers. So the first one is basically directly from the patient itself. The second one, it could be from the uh, colleague who's working. Uh, if you are not directly taking care of the COVID-19 patient, but some of your colleague may taking care, and then you may have some break together, and then they may think that you are healthy, so they just take off their masks or their protection. So when, by talking together or eating together in the same space, they may have one. Another one, it could be kind of like in the public places, like uh, anyone who may have asymptotic one. There is no indication that you have uh, indicated that this person may have been infected. So there are a lot of risks, not only within their workplace one, but also among the college one, but then in the hospital itself or in the healthcare facility itself, and then even in the public one. 
So there are kind of like separate elements that you may be infected to among the healthcare workers. In the slide number six, uh, some study also kind of like uh, putting the uh, mapping. So who, what type of the occupation risk and then with the risk score from 0% until more likely, which is 100%. So the color in slide number six, uh, the blue one is basically non uh, people who work in the non-health sectors, and then uh, the green color is basically people who work in the uh, health sector one. As you can see there, one, there are very clear evidence and the patterns that non-healthcare workers is kind of like less risk comparatively with those who are working in the healthcare workers. In particular, those who are directly involved in terms of uh, taking care of the patients. The dentists become the one. The nurses become the, the high risk as well. Uh, the lowest uh, risk is basically they said about people who just doing uh, indirectly to see the others, kind of like more the analytic uh, or behind the desk, uh, like the computer network activities. It doesn't mean they're not getting that one, but they have less risk when they did their job comparatively with those who were working in terms of the healthcare uh, sectors. So that's basically uh, our uh, background, why we are interested in doing that one. So the next slide in slide number seven, uh, before we focus on the uh, healthcare itself, we just want to give an idea. What we have done is basically we try our best to make some very systematic review. It is different comparatively with the other review, like only narrative review, which is kind of like only offer a few specific topics and then just identify information gaps and then we just recommend it new research. Uh, or the second uh, type of review, like rapid re review. So basically you're just putting everything on the table and then uh, in the short time, right? Just kind of like more descriptive one. Scoping review is more kind of like a little bit advanced, but still kind of like less advanced and systematic uh, review one. So basically, this is like preliminary assessment, not even only mapping out everything. That's kind of like without analysis. So systematic review is basically more kind of like you try to collect everything. All kind of like possible research has been conducted, but not only that one, we also assess what about the quality of this research. So the highest quality one that we would like to have, then we did kind of like to answer our situation. So uh, in the slide number eight, it's basically, I just give you an idea about uh, some publication. In particular, during this uh, pandemic situation, if you Google in uh, Google Scholars or in terms of any uh, publication, journal publication, more and more uh, people doing this uh, a few because we couldn't go directly to the field. We couldn't go directly to ask a lot of people. So the systematic review, rapid review, and a lot of reviews become more kind of like trending during this pandemic situation, which is it's kind of like more and more uh, publication about that one. Uh, so you can find uh, in very highly uh, ranking journal and also in local journal as well. So go back to the systematic review. What we are doing is basically there are seven steps like what we presented in our slide number nine. Uh, so we have to start with that kind of like question. What the question that we want to ask in this particular uh, study, we want to know about what are the situation of the mental uh, to the healthcare workers that have been conducted in a lot of studies. Then we did it systematic uh, searching, and then we assessed that one, and then at the end we can like synthesize, and then we present it in an off report, of course in the of publication. But mind you, uh, the difference between systematic review is basically uh, we need to have a quite fairly broad sample of literature. It's not just like one or two or ten, but we need as as much as possible that we have. 50, 70, 100, if, if before we do analysis, we uh, 
assess of the quality, but we need a lot of them. And then the novelty of this review is about uh, something new to say. Say, for example, uh, in different perspectives, we need to say that this is kind of like very important because of this is kind of like the evidence shows very significant. One. The timeline is also a very uh, big deal in this one. So the faster you do it, kind of like uh, during COVID-19 here, so a lot of people never done it before, so we have to present it right away. Otherwise, uh, some people may be already kind of like presenting somewhere else. So the timeline, your could be the number one. So that's kind of like uh, the review become the best quality. So uh, in slide number 10, it's basically we saw the systematic how uh, you're doing uh, systematic review. Uh, you may have also heard about the meta-analysis, what I'm going to let you know later on. So there are at least four uh, steps that you have to do. The first one is you need to identify. Uh, you're doing using database. Uh, whatever you have database, you can have from uh, Scopus database, you can have from the World of Science database. Uh, and on top of that one, you may also want to do it manually because of some journal or some publication may not be even published uh, widely. So you can put that into your account by kind of like uh, either Google uh, and then also contacting some uh, research center and so on. So adding in top that one, not only from database, but also from other sources. And then you screen that one into the uh, number. We need to kind of like uh, to check whether there are some duplication. Maybe the same author, only different cases, but they're using the same study. Uh, after that, we need to evaluate. So the evaluation needs to uh, based on some several measures that we are going to present it later on. So at the end, so basically uh, the inclusion of study that based on the quality of the studies. So usually, for example, if uh, I'm using the mixed method appraisal tools that have kind of like 14 scale, so the, the good quality is basically when the scale is already, uh, the rank of the scale is more than 10. So below 10, we may not so sure. Even below seven or eight, uh, six, that kind of like, no, it's not really good quality. So the difference that I said uh, with the meta-analysis basically, when you're doing it more uh, synthesis again, the result, and then you quantify that one, uh, looking at with the uh, mathematical uh, analysis, then you did it not only describe it and then assess it, but then also doing it the analysis again from that result. So that's different between meta-analysis. So systematic review is basically one step before doing it meta-analysis, but it's already kind of like having a good quality after the systematic review. Okay. So uh, in short, uh, in slide number 11, we say that uh, there are two things that you need to do uh, if you emphasize only two things. The first one is search strategy and then uh, proposition to synthesis the data. So that's basically two element one. Uh, how are you going to assess the quality of this, uh, the data in the data and also the outcome from the study that has been included? There are several tools that you can use. Uh, what I'm presenting in slide 11 here is basically two uh, types of tools that have been used widely. The first one is Study Quality Assessment Tool, or usually they call it SQAT, from the National Institute of Health United States. Uh, it's basically assess the quality and also the risk of individual type of included study design. They include with the case report studies, with the nine item uh, control and also case control studies with 12 item control. So the second uh, mostly widely uh, has been used is mixed method appraisal tools uh, or they call it as MA, MMAT. Uh, so it's basically about, it's more looking at the methodological part, qualitative research, randomized control trial, non-randomized, quantitative descriptive studies and also mixed method studies. Uh, in the 
Slide number 12, I just give you some idea what we're looking at that one. So it's basically, there are kind of like the standard question has been asked. So for example, uh, the screening process before going to that more in depth is basically asking about, are there clear research questions in the study they've been including? Or do the collected data allow to address the research question? So if you answer about that one from the study is yes and yes, then you go to the second question, the third question, and, and so on. But if the beginning, they already starting to say no and no, and they say like, so there is no point that the study is going to be included, right? So because that's kind of like the uh, entry point of the quality. So basically, the searching can be based on just the name and the uh, keyword, but then in to be included into more detailed analysis, you have to kind of like uh, fulfill or comply to the certain element about the quality of the studies. So when the score is become like higher than 10, then we include it if it is kind of like scale between one to 14. But if it is kind of like less than eight or bit less than even seven, then yeah, we definitely say like, no, 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 this is not going to be included. So that's kind of like the beginning of um, my study. So now focus on uh, our study on the mental health status of healthcare workers, like I present in the slide number 30. So our research question is basically asking what is known about the mental health status of healthcare workers in dealing with COVID-19 patients. So our research strategy using uh, for the database, we use four main ones, PubMed, Scopus, uh, Web of Science, and also Embase. So the language is uh, we try to mainly uh, English, but also we try if there are the abstract part, there is an English question, uh, we may also include local language. If uh, some of our colleagues knew about that one, then we ask their help, but otherwise we can like missing that one as well. So when we do this study, it's uh, during uh, the beginning, like December 2019 until uh, April 2020. If you are doing it now, you may kind of extend it until 2021, okay? That depends on, as I said, timeline, it's a very, very crucial one. Top publication, we try to be included everything, including journal, report, or brief notes, and so on, that what have been conducted in uh, this particular one. The keywords, uh, we use kind of like the main three keywords, the coronavirus, uh, psychological impact, healthcare workers. But also we use the variant of that one. Say, for example, SARS, uh, not 19, 2019, uh, or anxiety, or this uh, mental disorder, uh, sleep uh, disorder, and so on. Something to do like kind of like with the psychological impact, and then healthcare workers, nurse, uh, GP, and so on. It's basically the combination of that one. And for the quality assessment, we use the uh, quality assessment tool for observational cohort and cross-sectional study proposed by NHLBI. Okay, so the summary of the study is uh, being presented in slide number 14, which is we start with those four database, uh, Scopus, uh, PubMed, uh, Words of Science, Embase, and then we identify about 100 ones. Eventually later on, when we already did it some uh, screening, duplication, but also quality, we adding with other four because of uh, we see only about seven, it is kind of like very small number. And then we try with the manual, including with Google scholars and also contacting research center, we finally having added uh, four, so in total, we end up having 11. So that's kind of like uh, when we score everything, uh, the quality is quite high one. Uh, some have 10, some has 11, some has 12, some the highest one mostly about 13. So in on average, it's about 11.81 out of 14 scale that we uh, assess this study. So this is quite uh, very relevant. Uh, if you can see in... Uh, Later on in the slide uh, 16, uh, not, uh, 18, 19, 20, and so on, that's kind of like the study we included. 
But before going to that one, in the slide number 15, uh, I'm going to give you some uh, summaries, the finding that we have. Okay. So we start with 100, as I uh, told you before. Uh, we presented in uh, slide number 14. And then we did some kind of like uh, screening and then analyzing that one and then become only 11 studies were eligible for this study. About the population included in the studies uh, been selected uh, nurses mostly and female workers, the frontline healthcare workers, younger medical staff and also workers, uh, in particular in the area with higher infection rate, reported more severe degrees of course, psychological symptoms than other healthcare workers. Trauma Traumatization uh, mostly happened in, among those who are in the non-front lines, uh, but then in terms of uh, depression, anxiety, and also the stress. Uh, the lowest one record that we found is basically roughly about 12%, 24%, 29%, 28%. And the highest one, even we got a report from that one, is about... Uh, 55, 62%, and 67, almost kind of like more than 50% of the workers. So if you recall back again, uh, I presented back uh, the previous slide uh, about the occupational risk score with the COVID-19, uh, again in slide number 16. I just want to recall everyone's uh, memory back about who are these kind of like the uh, people who are kind of like uh, having higher risk one? Yes, you can see that uh, those, not only those people who are in the front line directly dealing with the patient, but also those who are in the non front line one. So yes, uh, the mental uh, health one even kind of like severe, for those who are in the, uh, the front line, but not necessarily in that one, but also in the non front line nurses, they also got kind of like the traumatization. Uh, being kind of like uh, later on, I'm going to tell about what are those kind of like uh, the situation kind of like affecting their health. One. Right? So you can see that in the uh, summary in uh, for the finding in slide number 17. So when we did the study, first one is about geographic one. We actually trying to include everywhere, including with the Asian countries, African countries, uh, European countries, and so on. But the, the highest quality, according to our assessment, is mostly in China. So of nine out of eleven, we got every studies from China. Only two uh, out of China, which is about like uh, Italy and Spain. The outcome measure, uh, when we're dealing with the uh, issue of the mental health, and they are talking about the anxiety. They are talking about depression, stress, insomnia, uh, and also distress one. Uh, another one that kind of like also related to something to do with, for example, fear, self-efficacy, sleep quality, risk perception, uh, not only about anxiety in general, but also that anxiety, social desirability, and also social support. That's also kind of like being uh, discussed in that study as well. So, okay, look at the mental health. So, the biggest prevalence uh, of anxiety is basically varied from one study to the other. Some say it's about 24%. One study said 25%. Others kind of like about 44%. Uh, some others kind of like almost kind of like having uh, the range, not only kind of like percentage, but also the proximate about 22% plus minus with 7.56, kind of like the quite high one as well. So this is basically to reveal that anxiety, one of the uh, mental health outcomes or the measures had a positive correlation with the total stress load score and all dimensions that have been measured. Uh, 
in the slide number 18, 19, and 20 later on, uh, I present you all the studies have been included in the analysis. So if you look at the more detail into the publication that I referred to you before, uh, we put, uh, we input in that uh, column summary specifically the geography, the population and sample size. The sample size is varies from the lowest one about 59 uh, in the study number four, and then the highest sample is about 5,000 uh, population. The mostly including with the nurses when we categorize with the M, uh, when we set only the uh, T is about the total, P is physician, and then the N is nurses. So GP including with a general practitioner and so on. Okay. So have a look in that the publication, the uh, what we abbreviation in that one. But the most interesting one is basically uh, the outcome of characteristics, including with the uh, anxiety, including about the stress. Uh, a lot of kind of like uh, having a very valid measure. The scale is something from zero until uh, 27, for example for uh, general health, uh, for GAD, for example, like the general anxiety disorder, uh, a lot of that uh, has been measured. And then you can see at the last corner one, yes, it's the quality of the standardization is kind of like, for example, the first one uh, is about 13, which is quite high one, okay? So have a look uh, in your time in the uh, guidance. Uh, from slide number 18, 19, and 20. Those basically study has been included in our uh, analysis one. Okay, so what we find is basically uh, continue from just the mental health one. Stress is also one thing that is also very relevant uh, among the healthcare workers dealing with uh, patient COVID-19. The high of about 30% of the health workers reported stress in uh, many studies, including one study which is almost reaching to 30%. Uh, another study is also kind of like comparing between not only the health workers but also non-healthcare workers. Uh, the stress, depression, insomnia, about 63% of the healthcare workers reported a mental disorder. And just looking at a very simple one like a general health question, uh, with a 12 score, GH, uh, GHQ 12 score, it is more than three in general. So it's basically, if you compare with other study during just uh, normal time without the pandemic situation, this is kind of like, not kind of like, they are really healthy one. But having this one is kind of like very, very high one. So the lowest reported of those kind of like the mental issues, uh, even for us, it's already kind of like very significant. The lowest one, uh, depression, they said about 12.1. Uh, others about anxiety, about 24.1%. Or the stress is about 29.8%. So that's kind of like the lowest one. So imagine for the even highest one. In the slide number uh, 22, uh, so basically uh, we try to present about what other uh, mental health issues that need to be uh, relevant, investigated, or to be presented, saying that not only those kind of like you can see physically, stress and uh, anxiety, but also others kind of like we may not be uh, observed physically, like sleep disturbance, fearness, uh, traumatization, but also the workplace environment, the effect of that working environment, okay? The sleep disturbance, that's also a very high one. One study, for example, uh, reported about 34% of respondent complaint of insomnia. You can imagine the patient may have, may come like, not kind of like a, knowing about the timing. It could be early in the morning, it could be mid of the day, it could be late in the evening one. They have to go
go directly to the ICU, in particular if it is kind of like already very severe. So you have to kind of like be ready. Even some places they may just sleep in the workplace. It's, they cannot go home because of that kind of like the highly demand, in particular in the beginning one. The fear is also uh, one thing is in terms of psychological problem. Uh, during the peak one, in particular, like most of people can like cannot be treated or cannot be uh, helped at all anymore, can like be dead. The not only uh, the fearness of can like having been infected, but also can like uh, remorse and so can like very uh, just kind of like feeling sad. Uh, it is kind of like somebody can like. Uh, you see something almost every day. Somebody may die because of this causes one, right? So it may also feel about yourself. What happened if I'm the one who would be infected? So kind of like a lot of kind of like this one, some uh, percentage even higher up to 70.6% and also 58.8%. When we compare between those who are directly, the, the physician and also the nurse, comparatively with the administrative staff group even already for like 58%. That's kind of like the, to show you the level of the fairness among these healthcare workers. Traumatization is also happening. Uh, not only uh, the fairness would be the frontline one, but the trauma is also among those who are not in the frontline one. So the working environment is also kind of like, uh, in particular in the area with high incidence of infection. Uh, was significantly associated with the higher stress and psych psychological disturbance. So imagine if this study was included with the uh, situation in, back in 2021. Mind you that this the study that we included so far just during the first year, 2020. Uh, I couldn't imagine that if we also include with those uh, situation after the Delta variant came where everyone agreed this is kind of like much severe, the impact comparatively with the, the, the first one. Uh, later on, uh, this year, uh, last year, 2021, uh, when the Omicron started, even until now, people said that, yes, the new variant coming in, but less one. So, I don't know. The, the still mental uh, health is still going to be kind of like uh, very, very... Uh, evidence, but also the reporting could be something more, not only sleep disturbance, not only fear, but also maybe something else. So uh, toward at the end, uh, that's basically what uh, we found from those uh, included in our study. So then we we're thinking about to give some recommendation and conclusion to this one, is the, like what we're trying to present starting in slide number 23. So what kind of thing that we need to say to, because the idea present this one is basically to make aware for everyone, in particular the government and also those the manager in the healthcare workers, among the healthcare workers, say something about this one. Hey, have a look, this study presents you that some really uh, robust evidence that the health, uh, mental health among the healthcare workers very uh, being disturbed by this kind of like pandemic situation. So what kind of thing that we can do? So we come up with an idea having like the intervention. The intervention trying to ease, at least to give kind of like release a little bit, uh, the stressful, the anxiety, and also the sleep disorder among these healthcare workers by uh, at least having uh, intervention in terms of supportive, encouragement and motivational, protective among those, and also giving training and educational intervention. So we know that uh, the healthcare workers not only part of these uh, healthcare places, hospital or clinic and so on, but also they are part of the family. They are part of this community, big community. So why don't we have also support from uh, everyone to these healthcare workers? So the family was kind of like, uh, understanding about how big their role, how big their uh, important job is this one. So that be just verbally saying giving support is only kind of like giving them kind of like 
uh, ease a little bit their feeling rather than stress or fear or trauma decision here. They also come back having, yes, a lot of people knowing about this one. The second one is about encouragement and motivational. Not only about supportive from the society, but also a direct encouragement and motiv- motivation of them. It's also kind of like uh, going to kind of like boost their spirit, right? Because they have been overwhelmed with the situation. Imagine just like this is kind of like the car or the bus or the airplane capacity is kind of like very limited. Uh, they also, as a human being, they have some capacity also limit. They have only 24 hours. They have maybe the energy only like uh, 10 or 12 or even the biggest one, 20 hours energy. But over that one, they could be kind of like stressed already. So giving recognition and appreciation directly or kind of like in terms of incentive or in terms of anything to their effort can kind of going to boost their spirit. They, we may be kind of like giving them time to visit therapists if they have to, uh, to just kind of like to ease their emotion and then to kind of like let them go about what they hold in terms of their emotion, psychological suffer and frustration. Uh, in slide number 24, I also kind of like continue what we talked about before, uh, giving protective. So it's kind of like, uh, like Omicron these days, people say that uh, the vaccine itself is not kind of like the protection you can have, but you also need to have very uh, proper of the uh, health uh, protection, like wearing masks all the time, or use uh, hand sanitizer, or kind of like uh, cleaning uh, your hand every time doing something, okay? So protective uh, can also be done by providing adequate and effective protective equipment. Like, yes, uh, we are happy to hear that the, all the frontliner health workers being kind of like prioritized for having uh, vaccination in the first place, even they got already booster in a lot of places once. Uh, regular break, for example, we need to remind them, yes, they also sound like they be needed, but also they need a uh, break because they are against human beings. Uh, it's not unlike a machine all the time, 24 hours, 7. They need at least some break as well. The training and education, uh, maybe kind of like they need to be more careful in dealing with sometimes. So sometimes people like, uh, they're still thinking about the old uh, typical situation. Uh, maybe because of this is a new virus, as I said, what we knew now could kind of like already not even validate in the next day or next week and so on. So at least they're being reminded or they're being informed by training or new education, updating about again and again what needs to be done or what needs to be known for them. So uh, last but not least is also uh, we recommend it basically the use of technology because uh, we're dealing with the, the pandemic that kind of like transmitted uh, by respiration, by having uh, droplet and so on. So if you could kind of like keep the distance, so the technology can basically can uh, put that distance. Please make sure that they still can do whatever they have to do, but in terms of, in terms of distance. So. I'm using the example of M Health in this one, for example. Uh, GP these days already, like, uh, rather than going directly to see the, our doctor, we can also ask them that, uh, indirectly having telephone or FaceTime or even Zoom time one. So we can ask directly about what the symptoms and then what possible recommendation that could be advised. So in that particular way that we try to uh, mitigate what can the bad thing could happen. So just having the, the distance, uh, not even in the crowded area. So that's why a lot of countries, including in Australia, for example, the recommendation is, the recommendation is basically if it is not necessary to see your GP, you don't have to fix it directly. You can uh, use the uh, telephone or online one. Uh, because we have experienced during the pandemic situation a lot of that non-pandemic uh, illness 
like uh, people who need to be operated, people who are having op- uh, surgery, they've been postponed because of that situation. It's impossible because the capacity of the healthcare is also kind of like not enough at that time. So I think uh, by saying that one, uh, I would like to conclude my uh, tele- lecture today. Thanks, Jen. I give it back to you. Thank you very much, um, Sally. That, that's fascinating. It's interesting, isn't it? There's been so much published over the last two years um, on COVID-19 itself, but there's been a distinct lack of work in this, this area. So I think you've given us much food for thought on a really important um, topic. Um, and I really do hope that some of the recommendations that you've made do get um, looked at carefully in terms of, you know, um, managers acknowledging some of the impacts of caring for, for people with COVID-19 um, on our healthcare workers. Um, I just wanted to, to ask you, what do you think is the next logical step in terms of research in this area? Is there, is there one? Is there a place for uh, more qualitative um, work? For the mental one, yeah. Uh, I'm, mm. I'm basically more uh, looking at the mixed method one. So yes, the mm. qualitative important one, but also, as I said, uh, refer to my uh, group study here. Is basically we did it only during the uh, the first period of pandemic one. So. I wonder what's happening in the second period, in particular when the Delta peak happened. So I was thinking like the result could be still the same, but also could be even worse because of the overwhelm. So I don't know. That's kind of like also my, uh, my, my wonder about that one. But the qualitative mm-hmm. is very important, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because we actually could have a totally separate panda, uh, epidemic happening, couldn't we, in terms of mental health in, in this group that could go yeah. um, unacknowledged if we're not careful. So, so it's a fascinating topic and thank you so much for um, covering covering it for us as part of our Weber training lecture series. Um, I think that this will clearly become even more important as we progress through the, the Greek alphabet, really, during this pandemic. So. Um, so if you do progress this study and, and go on to, to do a second phase, I'd be fascinated to perhaps invite you back and um, we'll hear more, more about this. So thank Definitely. you once again for presenting no. to us today on, on this really important topic. The next slides um, on your um, slide um, presentation are the up-and-coming um, lectures within the Weber training schedule. Uh, up until March, so I do hope that those of you listening in will be able to join us uh, for some of those. And then just on your final slide, I'd just like to acknowledge our patron sponsors of Weather Training, very important um, source of support for us um, in this lecture series. So thank you to our speaker and thank you to those of you who've taken the time out to listen in to this lecture and I look forward to speaking to you all again at some point in the future. Thank you and goodbye.